In simple terms, what are TCP IP protocols? Well, let me give you an analogy as a way of helping people understand what is this about. It's about computer to computer communication, basically. How do we get one computer of one brand like IBM to talk to another computer uh, like a Hewlett Packard machine? They uh, were not originally designed to be interworkable necessarily. There were networks available, uh, uh, you know, a digital equipment corporation when it still existed had a network called DECnet, which allowed digital equipment machines to talk to each other. And IBM had something called systems network architecture. Uh, but we're, we're talking back in the late 60s and early 70s, but there weren't any um, brand or, or non-proprietary protocols available for computer communication. So the TCP IP protocols were uh, stimulated uh, by uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency to allow different brands of computers and different networks uh, that had different uh, functional capabilities like Ethernet versus uh, packet radio uh, versus satellite communications versus optical fiber. All these different media had somewhat different protocols. The question is, how do we build an overlay on top of all those bearing uh, substrates to allow intercomputer communication of a non-proprietary type. So that's what TCP IP was intended to do. And the best way to describe how it works is to start out with the internet protocol, the IP layer, which is the one that lives just above uh, the link and physical layer where we're actually carrying bits that are signaled by optical fiber or signaled by radio. So imagine for just a moment uh, that uh, you know something about postcards and suppose you have an electronic postcard and like a real postcard, it has a source address, a destination address, and it has some content on it. And if you think of internet packets as electronic postcards, a lot of, uh, about postcards applies to like uh, these uh, internet packets. For example, if you put a postcard into the post box, there's no guarantee the post office will deliver it. There's a prob high probability that it will be delivered, but it's probabilistic, it's best efforts. Uh, if you put two postcards into the post box intended to go to the same destination, there's no guarantee they come out in the same order you put in. This is true of internet packets as well. They could get out of order because parts of the system might retransmit a packet thinking it had gotten lost and somebody might get two copies of it. So it'll have to filter out the duplicates and put things back in order. Uh, so the uh, this very basic kind of uh, transfer this is best efforts. It loses things. It duplicates things. Uh, and you might ask yourself, <laughs> why would anybody want to have a, a protocol, an internet protocol that has those properties? And the answer is, it's it's the simplest possible thing you could ask an underlying system to do uh, that might uh, might be uh, successful uh, at delivering packets with some probability greater than zero. But then the next question is, well, how do I make it a more disciplined thing that I can rely on? And the answer is you put another layer of protocol, we call it TCP or transmission control protocol. So what does that do? Well, the best way to illustrate that is to say, imagine for a moment that, uh, that you have a postal system that only delivers postcards. That's it, you know, no bulk packages, no big fat envelopes, just postcards. And you have a book that you want to send to your friend through this postal service. Uh, well, uh, let's see, if you if that's all you could do, you'd have to tear the pages out of the book, probably have to cut them up so they fit on the postcard. And then you'd notice that uh, not every postcard has a page number on it because you cut it up. So then you know that they might get out of order. So you number every postcard, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then you keep copies of the postcards just in case you have to send another one because you know that they might get lost. And then you kind of wonder, well, how do I know if I need to uh, to send another you know, copy of a postcard? And you get this brilliant idea. Well, of course, I'll have my friend send me a postcard saying I got everything up to postcard number 420. And then you realize that postcard might get lost. So now what? And the, the answer is, well, you look at your watch and if you haven't heard anything back from your friend, or maybe you look at your calendar, uh, then you start sending uh, these duplicate postcards until you do get a postcard finally uh, that says, I got everything up to whatever the number is. Uh, so that is, uh, and of course, the numbers allow you to put things back together and identify duplicates and so on. Uh, oh, the last problem 
uh, related to this is suppose that uh, you turn your thousand page book into 2000 postcards and you take them all down to the post office and by some miracle, the post office delivers all 2000 postcards at the same time to your friend's post box and they don't fit. Some of them fall on the ground, the wind blows them away, the dog chews them up. So you say, well, okay, I'll have a deal with my friend. I won't send more than, let's say, 200 postcards at a time until I get back an acknowledgement that uh, my friend got them and then I'll send the next batch. That's flow control. So now you know basically how the TCP IP protocols work. That's basically how the internet works. Now I've left out some important details like how do the networks know how to route traffic through multiple networks to get to the destination? Uh, what about this domain name thing, you know, like google.com? How do you figure out where, where to go? Because you have to translate that name into an internet protocol address to say where this the electronic postcard is supposed to go. And there are a bunch of other, you know, things to worry about, like cryptography and exchange of keys. So there's more to know about the internet than TCP IP. Uh, one thing I should tell you is that when we started, Bob Kahn and I, we had just one protocol called TCP and it did everything. And then we split the IP protocol out because there were some people who wanted uh, packets to be delivered as quickly as possible, even if they didn't all get there. So for packetized voice, packetized video, radar traces, and things like that, there's always more coming. And if somebody misses something, they can say, I didn't hear that, please repeat. Uh, so we invented the user datagram protocol sitting on top of IP, just like TCP does, for real-time communication. So now we've got uh, several different mechanisms for use of the internet. And what we're doing right this moment is very likely a combination of TCP IP and, uh, and some uh, streaming protocols over UDP for real-time interaction. Could you explain how you work on TCP IP protocols and internet architecture help to lay the foundation for the internet we use today? So my work on the TCP IP protocols began with my colleague Robert Kahn. Uh, Bob worked on the ARPANET, the predecessor to the internet. It was a large packet switch network, the first big large-scale network built uh, using packet switching technology. He was at Bolt, Baron, Neck and Newman in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and was one of the designers of the uh, ARPANET. We got to know each other when I was at UCLA as a graduate student, and I was helping him test the ARPANET system. Uh, we found a number of mistakes that needed to be corrected in the protocols that were used uh, by the ARPANET. Then I moved to Stanford and Bob moved to the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which funded the original ARPANET project. And ARPA had come to the conclusion that the ARPANET was sufficiently successful that we should start thinking about using computers in command and control, meaning the uh, uh, people in the military could use the computer to help manage their campaigns and their logistics and things like that to make their programs more effective. And uh, in, we realized that in order for that to work, they would have to put computers in mobile vehicles, ships at sea, and aircraft. And uh, we had only built the ARPANET based on dedicated telephone circuits connecting the packet switches to each other. So Bob came out to Stanford and, uh, and said, you know, here's the problem. We've got these different kinds of networks, which he's already started working on, mobile packet radio and packet satellite, in addition to the ARPANET. Uh, and uh, and so, but they had different protocols for those each of those networks, different addressing structures, different delay, different error rates, uh, different packet sizes. And the question was, how do we meld all of those different kinds of networks into a common infrastructure? Oh, and by the way, down the street was Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, where Bob Metcalf and David Boggs were inventing the Ethernet, uh, which is running on a coaxial cable at three megabits a second, which is really fast compared to most of the other communication protocols of the day. Even the backbone rate on the ARPANET was only 50 kilobits a second. So uh, Bob and I started working on that uh, on that design in a, over a period of about six months until uh, the fall of 73, we came up with uh, the basic idea of what that we call TCP. And uh, that we wrote a paper that was published in uh, May of 1974 by the IEEE Transactions on Communications. And that paper was called A Protocol for Packet Network Intercommunication. And that laid out the basic ideas behind the TCP IP or the uh, TCP protocol at the time. 
by this time, of course, I'm at Stanford. And so in uh, the beginning of uh, 1974, even before that paper was published, my graduate students and I were working on the detailed specification of the TCP protocol, the state diagram, the kinds of uh, control packets that would go back and forth to set up TCP connections. So by December of 1974, uh, three of us, uh, I was the lead author, Jochen Dalal and Carl Sunshine were my two graduate students whose names were on a RFC request for comments 675 describing uh, the internet transmission control uh, protocol. So that detailed spec uh, was then uh, implemented by three different groups starting in 1975. Uh, my group at Stanford, uh, a, a group at Bolt, Baranek and Newman in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, and also a group at University College London uh, under the leadership of Peter Kirstein. So we had three implementations, independent ones, of the TCP protocol, which we began uh, testing in 1975 and very quickly discovered that we had made errors that, that emerged as we actually tried to use the protocol uh, in a live environment. That led to a whole series of revisions to the protocol. We went through four different revisions. And in the third revision, we split the IP layer out from what had been part of TCP. and kept the uh, flow and, and congestion control, duplicate detection and all that in the TCP layer. And then the IP layer was just basically the electronic postcards uh, finding their way through the network from source to destination. What are your predictions for how the internet will evolve in the future and what impact could AI have, for example? Well, I think the internet will evolve in some uh, very clear dimensions. For one thing, higher speed radio access is likely. Uh, I think we'll see indoor uh, Wi-Fi access improving dramatically. The current access methods are not very efficient. There are better designs that are on the way with Wi-Fi 7, Wi-Fi 7E and things like that. Uh, low Earth orbiting satellites have expanded access to the internet to every square inch of the globe, or they, they uh, will eventually. Uh, and that's very helpful because we can't pull fiber into the middle of the ocean. We put it on the ocean floor to link continents together, but we don't have fiber sticking up here and there in the middle of the ocean for people to uh, connect to. I will say that um, subsea cable is rapidly emerging as uh, a, a viable mechanism, an affordable mechanism for uh, creating high speed connectivity, even in, among the islands in the Pacific and the Atlantic, which surprised me. So we're going off planet with the low earth orbiting satellites and uh, we're building increasing amounts of optical fiber for east, west and uh, north, south interconnect. The next big thing is the interplanetary internet that has been uh, in research since 1998. It's reached the point now where there are commercial uh, versions of what is called the bundle protocol suite, which is like the TCP IP suite, except it operates in uh, a parametric environment, which is much different from TCP IP, where round trip times tend to be less than a half a second. In the, in the case of the interplanetary system, the round trip times could be 40 minutes, could be two hours, could even be days, depending on how far away the parties are that are trying to communicate. Uh, also, there's disruption that occurs in uh, the solar system, you know, rotating planets, for example, or if you're talking to somebody on on the surface, the planet rotates, you can't talk to them until it comes back around. Same problem with some satellites. So we have a de variably delayed and disrupted environment for uh, solar system communication and a new protocol suite. The bundle protocol suite has been developed to deal with those uh, ex parametric expansion. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, the interplanetary protocols have been in operation on the International Space Station for well over a decade. Uh, we've done tests with uh, satellites that are 81 light seconds away. Uh, we have low Earth orbiting satellites and the International Space Station. So that's another avenue for expansion uh, that we can foresee over the course of the next several years. The Artemis missions are already underway. They'll be on the moon by 2026 or sooner. Uh, we hope the interplanetary network will be uh, functioning uh, on the moon to support uh, the operation there. Uh, the next thing that we can see uh, happening uh, on the internet, I think, is an increased number of devices that are connected to the internet. 
the so-called Internet of Things or IoT will have tens of billions of devices in the long run. Some of them may be sensors that we're wearing, you know, a watch or some other device, uh, in addition to devices in the home, in the office, manufacturing facilities, all using the Internet locally and potentially globally in order to operate and to perform whatever function they are intended to, uh, to perform. So those are uh, several paths that we can see going forward. Uh, my guess is that we'll see increasing amounts of optical communication in space. We're already seeing optics for cross-satellite linking, uh, for example, in Starlink and other uh, low-Earth orbiting satellite networks, but we're also expecting optical communications to Mars and to the outer planets and maybe the inner planets as well. So uh, those are a few obvious things. Application space, lots of uh, machine learning is already underway. Uh, people are talking about large language models uh, and their <laughs> proclivity to hallucinate. We're going to have to work on that problem. Uh, but the, the large language models are turning out to be very powerful generators of content and in some cases even writing programs uh, you know, with, that you've asked for. Uh, you still have to scrutinize those programs and make sure they don't have bugs and they actually do what they're supposed to do. Um, nonetheless, language translation, language production, uh, speech to text translations, text to speech, all of those things are now possible using machine learning. In addition to the more conventional kinds of machine learning, for example, at Google, uh, we taught uh, a system to control the cooling of our data centers and saving about 40% of the power required to run the pumps and the valves that cool the data center by using machine learning as a quick way of, of uh, how, you know, automatically controlling those systems. Uh, and then another example uh, at DeepMind, one of our sister companies of Alphabet, figured out how proteins fold up and so they made a catalog of 200 million proteins that could be generated by human DNA. And that catalog may someday help us identify a way of intervening in case of a disease by using uh, a small molecule to interfere with the communication path between uh, a pair of, uh, of cells or within an organ. I'm sure that there are other ideas, and I hope that others who engage with you on this topic will come up with another long list of possibilities, but those are a few that come to my mind.